Who is the beast of Revelation 13? What is his image and what is his mark? There is a second beast emerging from the land. Who is he? This is one of the most important lectures. These pieces of the Revelation puzzle will be put in place for us by Francois. May the Holy Spirit enlighten your mind while you are listening. In our previous study we discovered that the leopard-like beast of Revelation 13 is the papacy. And by comparing him with the little horn of Daniel 7, we discovered that they have the same characteristics. In the book of Revelation, John gives us additional information concerning the end-time work of the papacy. Revelation 13 verse 1 Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him power, his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Let's recap the history of this deadly wound that was inflicted on the papacy. The murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798 gave the French an excuse for occupying the eternal city and putting an end to the papal temporal power. The aged pontiff himself was carried off into exile to Valence. The enemies of the church rejoiced. The last pope, they declared, had resigned. Scholars, both inside and outside the Catholic Church, believed that at that time the papacy would never revive. But what did the prophecy say? The fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Does the whole world really follow the beast, the papacy? A few decades ago, the entire Protestant world was anti-Rome. What is the current situation? Time magazine of January 1995 named Pope John Paul II the Man of the Year. Did the secular and religious leaders of the world agree to this prophecy-fulfilling choice? Oh yes. Let's listen to what Billy Graham and the Dalai Lama of Tibet had to say. He'll go down in history as the greatest of modern popes, says the Reverend Billy Graham. He has been the strong conscience of the whole Christian world. On the island of Patmos, the prophet saw that the entire religious and political world would wander after the beast. Time magazine confirms it. He really has a will and a determination to help humanity through spirituality, says Dalai Lama. That is marvellous. That is good. I know how difficult it is for leaders on these issues. Revelation 13.5 And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. John wants us to clearly see the relationship between the little horn of Daniel 7.25 and the sea beast. If you convert the 42 months and the time, times and half a time of Daniel 7.25 into days... You get a total of 1,260 prophetic days, which equal 1,260 literal years. This interesting prophetic period occurs seven times, and in each case it refers to the papacy. It began in AD 538 and ended in 1798. Verse 6, he opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Daniel 7.25 is in perfect harmony with Revelation 13.6 when it says that the little horn would speak great words against the Most High. These two texts are in perfect harmony. To blaspheme is to place yourself in God's place and claim the power to forgive sins. Does the papacy blaspheme? Yes, it does. 
Look at this shocking quote. All names in which the scripture are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. We hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. This comes from the great encyclical letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, page 304. You know, I'm amazed at the accuracy of Bible prophecy. Every single prediction concerning the papacy has thus far been fulfilled. What about the blasphemous claim that the church can forgive sins? William Doyle writes, The poor sinner kneels at his confessor's feet. He knows he is not speaking to an ordinary man, but to another Christ. He hears the words, I absolve thy sins, and the hideous load of sins drops from his soul forever. This comes from the book, Shall I Be a Priest? page 14 and 15. Verse 7, He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. This description perfectly corresponds to the description of the little horn in Daniel 7 and 21. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. The papacy is a persecuting power. When I looked at these instruments of torture in Rome that were used on the Waldensians, I thought of Revelation 13, 7. He, that's the papacy, was given power to make war against the saints and conquer them. For how long would God allow this persecuting power to massacre his obedient children? Listen to this prediction. Verse 10, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed by the sword. There is a very good reason why John mentions the 1798 captivity of the papacy at this stage. He wants us to focus on the time when the second beast would make his appearance. Let's read about this land beast. Verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. When did he make his appearance? Around about the time when the first beast received its deadly wound. And when was it? 1798. This is one of the most amazing prophecies in scripture. There is only one country that fits the prophetic description of the land beast, and that is the United States of America. When I stood here at the Grand Canyon, I thought of the accuracy of God's prophetic clock. The United States of America had to appear at the time of the decline of the papacy. Did it happen? Yes. Just look at this exciting date, July 4, 1776. The signing of this document laid the foundation for a new nation. And then 11 years later, in 1787, the American Constitution was finally ratified. But now for the most exciting news of all. It was in the year 1798 that France became the last European nation to give official recognition to American independence. Did you get the date? 1798. When the great prophetic clock struck, America made its appearance on the scene of world history. Another great prophecy went into fulfillment. The well-known Statue of Liberty was a gift from France to the American people to commemorate their independence. Said an American historian, like a silent seed we grew into an empire. The second beast arose not from the sea of European nations, but the sparsely populated continent of North America. While on a visit to the Grand Canyon, I saw something that reminded me of the lamb-like nature of this great nation. Sing to God, sing praises to His name, lift up a song to Him who rides upon the clouds. His name is the Lord, exult before Him, Psalms 68 verse 4. But as John looks at this lamb-like beast, he hears a familiar but scaring sound. Verse 11 says the beast spoke like a dragon. In other words, the lamb-like phase of American history would be replaced by a dragon-like phase. 
What does the roar of the dragon mean? And who is the dragon roaring at? Well, we will have to go to the previous chapter for an answer. Revelation 12 verse 17 Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. What is the issue? God's commandments and those who keep them. More than a thousand years before the papacy changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, God revealed it to Daniel. And now the shocking and sad prediction that the land beast, America, would roar like the dragon, persecuting people globally who would obey the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. This implies that America will have to make certain amendments to a constitution which guarantees religious freedom. I can almost hear someone saying, impossible. America escaped the tyranny of religious intolerance and established a free democracy. She will never persecute people for religious reasons. But listen to verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This prophecy tells us that there will be some kind of religious and political alliance between Washington and Rome. Has this prophecy been fulfilled? Yes, it has. On October 20, 1951, President Harry Truman asked the American Senate to approve his nomination of an ambassador to the state of the Vatican City. Guess what happened? The churches were up in arms and said, Over our dead bodies. The mighty American president withdrew his proposal. Harry Truman wanted the American people to worship the beast, the papacy. But the prophetic time had not yet arrived. But 33 years later, President Ronald Reagan's nomination of William Wilson as ambassador to the Vatican City was quickly approved by the Senate, 81 to 13 votes. Only a few voices were heard worrying about church and state. Time magazine had this to say, Reagan and Cardinal Gasaroli last month, from a tangled history to a new beginning, recognition for Holy See. Washington agrees to diplomatic ties with the Vatican. Harry Truman liked a good scrap, but in 1951 he quickly backed down when American Protestants erupted in fury against his plan to extend diplomatic recognition to the Vatican. Even the president's own Baptist pastor in Washington denounced the idea from the pulpit. So abashed was Truman that he eliminated the post of the president's personal representative to the Holy See. During my visit to the Vatican, where almost every nation on the face of the earth has diplomatic ties, I thought of the accuracy of the prophecy of Revelation 13.3. The American presence in this complex was something nobody dreamed would ever happen. Through the fulfillment of these amazing prophecies, God wants to tell us that the second coming of Christ is much nearer than we think, and He wants you and me to be ready when He comes. Revelation 13.12 And He exercises all the authority of the first beast in His presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. What do you notice in this verse? It says America will cause or force all the inhabitants of the world to worship the beast. This implies that America must become the only end-time superpower. Is this the case today? Yes, look at this. Time magazine had this on its front page. Global cop coming soon to your country. You know, the Soviet Union is gone. And now America is the only superpower in the world. At Cape Kennedy I saw an amazing display of power of the second beast of Revelation 13. Just look at this powerful rocket. The USA is today the military, technological and financial giant of the world. Never before in history has the world seen such a superpower.
Never before has one nation influenced the world as America is doing right now. I visited the Liberty Square in Disney World and found two statements which reminded me of the global character of the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13. Look at the bottom line. It says, we are not a nation so much as a world. Herman Melville wrote this. Bring me men to match my mountains. Bring me men to match my plains. Men with empires in their purpose and new eras in their brains. Sam Walter Foss. While John observes the actions of the land beast, America, he sees something very interesting. I'm reading from Revelation 13, verse 13. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. What is the meaning of this fire, which the beast, apostate Protestant America, calls down from heaven? Is it the atomic bomb which they exploded? No. Verse 14 says he uses this fire to deceive the inhabitants of the entire world. We now have to search the Bible for a similar event where the genuine Holy Spirit fire descended from heaven upon people. And this we find in Acts chapter 2 verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. What happened after the fire of the Holy Spirit descended upon those early disciples? Well, they received the genuine gift of tongues and preached the gospel to the entire world. Two thousand years ago, the prophet predicted that the counterfeit Holy Spirit would initially be poured out in America. Has this prophecy been fulfilled? Yes. Professor Gerhard Hazel in his book Speaking in Tongues says that both the Pentecostal and the Charismatic movements were born in America. Today this phenomenon is binding the entire religious world to Rome. This counterfeit Holy Spirit has become the means that binds all Christian and non-Christian religions to Rome. What is going to happen after the second beast, apostate Protestant America, or the false prophet, as John calls him in Revelation 16.13, has deceived the whole world? Verse 15, And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Protestant America is going to set up an image in honor of the papacy. Let's go to the Old Testament to enlighten us on this issue of an image. On the plain of Dura, the king of Babylon erected an image and forced the world to worship it. Those who refused received the death sentence. This event serves as an example of what is going to happen soon. In the very near future, America is going to legislate to the world to honor the image of the papacy. Those who refuse will receive the death penalty. But what on earth is this image? Now this is not the real J.F. Kennedy, the first Catholic president in American history. It is only an image. But it reminds one of the real man. The image that America would erect in honor of the papacy will resemble the character of the papacy. This is a Swiss guard at St. Peter's in Rome. Now he is a symbol of what happened during the Middle Ages when the church used secular powers to persecute heretics. This was and still is the character of the papacy. In other words, an image to the beast will resemble the beast in persecuting people through secular authorities. Religious intolerance will again be practiced. Does this sound a bit far-fetched? Of course. At this stage, Amendment 1 of the American Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Prophecy tells me that America is going to ignore its constitution and start persecuting people like Rome did in days gone by. 
I'm reading from the great classic called The Great Controversy, page 445. It says, The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. An article in Time magazine had this to say about the separation of church and state. It is a mistake to apply American democratic procedures to the faith and the truth. I found an excellent explanation of the image of the beast in the book called The Great Controversy, page 443. It says, When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious powers must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Tele-evangelist Keith Turnier says, The wall of separation between church and state that was erected by secular humanists and other enemies of religious freedom has to come down. Those opposing our views are the new fascists. I want to tell you that the sun of religious freedom is setting at a tremendous pace. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. As the second century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the Court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting unconventional ones. It seems to be plain that by these laws the states compel one, under the sanction of law, to refrain from work or recreation on Sunday because of the majority's view on that day. The state by law makes Sunday a symbol of respect or adherence. The next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandate at a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state. As an outright insult to God and his law, only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. What will be the next step after the churches of America have taken control of the state? History tells us that when church and state unite, persecution is inevitable. Verse 15 says, Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Once the wall of separation between church and state in America has been demolished, the rest of the world will follow their example. The next event in the last great drama will be the receiving of the mark of the beast through legislation. Verse 16 says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And this is not going to be a microchip in your forehead or your hand. All these people at Epcot in Disney World received a mark on their hands. When I left, I too received one. The mark of the beast is something totally different. What is the seal of God and what is the counterfeit mark? 
In a previous lecture, we discovered that the Sabbath is the seal or mark of God. What would you say is the mark of the beast? You are looking at the statue of the famous Cardinal Gibbons. Catholics hold him in very high esteem. I want to quote him on this issue of what exactly the mark of the beast is. If you had any doubt, Gibbons will clear it. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. It comes from Catholic Record, September 1, 1923. The mark of the beast must be some human institution that stands in direct opposition to the seal of God. The apostate church tore the true Sabbath out of God's law, instituted Sunday, a festival borrowed from paganism, and now points to this bold action as the mark of a power. Will the mark of Sunday keeping, the mark of the beast, ever become law? Yes, this is what the Bible says. Verse 17 says, And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Another quote from The Great Controversy, page 446. Whoever should understandingly keep the law as thus changed would be giving supreme honour to that power by which the change was made. Such an act of obedience to papal laws would be a mark of allegiance to the Pope in the place of God. Very soon every person would have heard the facts about God's Sabbath and the Beast's Sunday. And after the facts have been presented, people will have to make a decision. If they choose to obey God, they will suffer persecution. But what will happen if they disobey and receive the mark of the beast that will be forced Sunday observance? If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. This is the most serious warning in the entire Bible. God regards worshipping on a Sunday instead of his holy Sabbath as the most serious form of rebellion in these end times. We have looked at the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and now we are going to look at the number of the beast. Revelation 13.18 Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. God wants you and me to be sure who the beast is. And that's why he ends this chapter with this number. A reformer, Andreas Helvig, 1572-1643, worked out the numeric value of the Pope's title on one of his mitres. By the way, the Latin vicarius file dei means vicar of the Son of God, which is a blasphemous title. While looking at another mitre, let's carefully add up the numeric value of the letters of this title. Here we have the first word, vicarius. Now the V stands for 5, I stands for 1, C for 100, A nothing, R nothing, I stands for 1, U stands for 5 and S stands for nothing. Here we have the next two Latin words, file, dei. The F has got no numerical value, the I stands for 1, L 50 and then the 2 I I stands for 1, 1. The D in Latin stands for 500, E nothing. The I stands for another one. Now what do these add up to? If you add up the numerical value of the word vicarious, you come to a total of 112. If you add up the value of filet, you get 53. And if you add the numerical value of the word DA, you get 501. And when you add up these three, you get a total of, guess what? 
666. We call this method of computation gematria. Revelation 13, 18 says, 666 is a man's number. His day of worship is man-made, and his number is man-made. When was man created? On the sixth day. Now there is nothing wrong with six if it leads up to seven. Six is the glory of man. It's all right if it leads on to seven, the glory of God. And this is what the Sabbath is all about. It points to God as the creator. And we little human beings are his creatures. But if I remain self-centered, 666, I become selfish. And a selfish person is always an ugly, beastly type of a person. And if I remain self-centered, I become intolerant, just like the beast of Revelation 13. God wants you and me to move away from the human 666 of self-centeredness into God's seventh day of spiritual rest. When I move from 666 to 7, I enter the symbol of his perfect rest of salvation by Christ. What are the rewards of those who worship Jesus on his terms? Revelation 15 verses 2 and 3 And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. I want to sing in that choir. What about you? God created man with a free will. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. God rewards those who choose to serve and obey him. What is your choice today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for revealing through your word our last day enemy. Please open our eyes so that we may see the dangers of his deceit. May we pay attention to this and find refuge in Jesus while there is still time. Help us to follow your guidance every step of the way till we are safe in our heavenly home with you. Amen.